Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Decoding Daniel. We're so glad you could join us for episode two, The Cosmic Warfare in Daniel. But before we start going through the questions, let's just talk to our Heavenly Father. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we're just so thankful and grateful for who you are to us. Thank you, Lord, that your faithful father, friend, that stick gets closer than a brother. Lord, you understand all the woes of human heart. Lord, whatever we go through, you are our shepherd. Remind us, Lord, that you care for every one of us, Lord. And we pray for this, uh, this, this uh, as we go through today, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will touch hearts, Lord, and draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so how was your week, Elder David? It was good. Very new, busy one. Visiting a new place, so that's exciting. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. My first time here in a new state. <laughs> yes. Are you keeping track of all the states you've been in now? Hmm. Well, mentally, I probably need to start <laughs> writing them down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, God is good. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I said I wanted to visit as many states as I could. It was just a desire in my heart, but you know what the word says? He grants us the travel. desires of the heart, That's right? right. <laughs> you love to travel, and so he, he, you're he getting opens. great experience. That's right. Great opportunities. Praise, praise the Lord for that. Yes. All right, so we're at episode uh, two, Elder David. So oh, and this, uh, is, this is an exciting uh, lesson also. Um, you know, and this this lesson of the the great conflict, the great controversy that uh, between good and evil, yeah. uh, between uh, righteousness and sin, between God's people and and uh, the adversaries' people. This goes clear back from the beginning. In fact, the very first prophecy mm -hmm. in the Bible is uh, Genesis three uh, three fifteen. Mm -hmm. and, and it says something very interesting that, that uh, it follows through the whole scripture. Mm -hmm. And it says, uh, I, when it, God or Jesus is, is talking to Satan and the serpent. And he right. says, I will put enmity between the woman, between you and the woman. Mm -hmm. So between Satan and, and God's people, there's mm -hmm. going to be enmity. That means they're going to be enemies. They're not going to get along. And it says, and between your seed and her seed. So uh, God's people and, and the enemy's people will always have conflict between them. And this is, this is a good thing. It's like they're, they're living for two different kingdoms. Mm -hmm. And that is what's being played out in the book of Daniel. And we'll see uh, that conflict uh, being drawn out as we as we open up this uh, this lesson. In fact, uh, it starts off with uh, number one. It says the book of Daniel opens. Who appears to be defeated in Daniel one one and two? It says that uh, Je Jehoiakim, king of Judah, was delivered into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And uh, this this goes way back. Uh, the prophets had been saying for a long time that if God's people were worshiping idols and turning away from God, that they would be taken captive and taken away uh, from their land. In fact, those of you who are familiar with the Bible stories will remember when King Hezekiah, a good godly king, mm. was sick and he was sick unto death and the prophet Isaiah came to him and he said, put your house in order for you are going to die and not live. Mm. And, and Hezekiah was grieved in his heart and he and he turned his face to the wall and he began to weep and, and he humbled himself before the Lord. Isaiah was leaving the palace and just going out. And before he got to the gate, the Lord says, go back and tell Hezekiah, because you have humbled yourself, I will add 15 years to your life. And then he said to Hezekiah, what sign would you like for me to give you to show you that, that you're going to have these extra 15 years? He said, would you like the sundial to go back forward 15 degrees or go backward 15 degrees? And Hezekiah said, well, it's no great thing for the sundial to go forward 15 degrees. Have the sundial go backward 15 degrees. Mm -hmm. You realize what, how significant that is? 
what will it take for the sundial to go backwards? That means the rotation of the earth would have to reverse mm. because isn't it the spinning of the, the earth that causes the sun to come up in one side and down the other? Right. Yes. God had to spin the earth backwards mm. 15 degrees to get that sundial to go backwards. So anyway, everybody in the then known world realized something was happening. In fact, uh, the king of Babylon sent some emissaries to Hezekiah and because he heard that he'd been sick and he mm. saw this sign in the heaven, the sun came back, went backward 15 degrees. Who ever heard of that? And so he sent these people to, to Hezekiah and uh, Hezekiah showed them his whole kingdom and showed them everything, how God had blessed him. And Isaiah came into his palace and he says, who was that that came to see you? And he said, well, that was emissaries from the king of Babylon. And he said, what did you show them? And he said, I showed them everything in my house. Mm -hmm. And Isaiah said, this king of Babylon is going to come and he's going to take everything in your house. In fact, even your children, those of the royal family are going to be made eunuchs and will be taken to the king of Babylon. So what we're reading here is the prophecy that God said to Hezekiah that his children, his offspring would become eunuchs. Daniel was one of those offspring. Mm. Now he was suffering from what the, the leaders of his nation had done before in not following after God. I find it interesting that even righteous people suffer the consequences of their leaders when they mm -hmm. stray away from God and mm -hmm. do what is wrong. But God in his mercy has a plan and God is going to use this situation where Daniel and his friends are in this foreign capital and he's going to uh, cause his, his name to be glorified. It also, number two, we're gonna look at that. It says, what ultimately happens to God's people? You see God's people uh, in, in Daniel 1 taken away into captivity. But in Daniel mm -hmm. chapter 12, it tells us that God's people will be delivered. Let me read that to you. It says in, in uh, Daniel 12 and verse 1, it says, And at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation, even until that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Amen. That book is the book of life. And mm. all who have accepted Jesus Christ and accepted and become partakers of his nature, having escaped the corruption in the, in the world that is there through lust, will be delivered at that time. So here we see God's people taken captive. But we see ultimately in the end, God is going to stand up. Mm. and deliver his people. Yes. The next section is the mighty deliverer of the book of Daniel. Yes. All right. So I'm, I'm glad we have a mighty deliverer. You know, in times like these, sometimes we feel hopeless when we see, you know, the pandemic and um, rumors of war in countries. It's, yes. it's good to know that, you know, in our time, we have a deliverer. So Let's get right into it. So the theme of the book of Daniel is the cosmic struggle that Elder David pointed out between um, good and evil. So the great controversy. So it says in number three, after Nebuchadnezzar cast uh, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace, how many people did he see in the fire? And we can find that in Daniel 3 and verse 25. And it says, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So Nebuchadnezzar actually saw the Son of uh, God walking there in the fire. All right, so that's the answer for that question. So he saw four men loose. And the next question is, who is this fourth one who walks through the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? So we, all, we, we already uh, read that verse. It says the fourth is like the son of God. So, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar being a heathen king could recognize, um, you know, the son of God. 
But you know, one thing that happens that I that I like about this is says that as his servants go through the fiery furnace, the Son of God goes through the fire with them. And I believe as we go through our fiery trials, God through his Holy Spirit is with us. Yes. Praise the Lord. So here's a tremendous picture of Jesus. He comes to deliver his people in the midst of their fiery trials. Jesus is the might to deliver. Amen. That's what we're Make, talking about. Makes me wonder if Nebuchadnezzar, he knew what the son of God looked like. It made me, made me wonder if he might have seen him in chapter two in that dream. Oh. Or, or somehow he knew who he was, right? Yes. I think the Holy Spirit was knocking at his heart's door. Uh, yes, he was. <laughs> As he's talk, knocking on all our heart's doors. Amen. It says here, describe the one who brings encouragement to Daniel in a later vision. Um, Daniel 10 and verses 5 to 6. I'm going to read that. It says, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. His body was also like the barrel and his face as the appearance of lightning and his eyes as lamps of fire. And his arms and his feet like in color to polish brass. And the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. So, and I think there's another picture also in the book of Revelation. And that's number six. It says, describe the being who appeared to John the Revelator in the book of Revelation. And we find this similar account in Revelation chapter one. And verses 13 to 16, and I'll read it. It says, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the son of man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and a gird about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his ears were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went the sharp two-hedged sword, which we know is the word of God, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So it's obvious from these two accounts, the one in Daniel chapter 10, 5 and 6, and here in Revelation 1, 13 to 16, that both Daniel and John the Revelator saw the same person, right? Yeah. So we can establish that part. So moving on to number seven, it says, who is this one who appeared to Daniel and John? And we just read that in Daniel chapter, uh, sorry, Revelation one in verse 13 gives us the answer. It was a son of man. So it is Christ himself who is pictured as being the son of man in Daniel and in Revelation, it says here, the one pictured as a deliverer, the one who has constant communion with his servant in both Old and New Testament times is none other than Jesus Christ. So we see that Jesus existed before um, his birth, his Bethlehem birth, as some would say, from the foundations of the world. But maybe that's, you could probably talk a little bit more about that, Elder David, in the next section head, uh, with the subheading, who is Christ? So back over to, to you. Yes. Yes, that's that's exciting. Um, remember when the the uh, wise men were coming? They were following that star all the way from the east. Mm. They, they were magi from the east. Um, these these wise men. Remember, uh, we're, we're going to discover as we study through the book of Daniel that Daniel was end up as he, as in, in chapter two, when he describes the, the vision and interprets it to King Nebuchadnezzar, he ends up being put over all the wise men of the kingdom. So mm -hmm. he was in charge of all the wise men, the Chaldeans and the philosophers and all these people. Daniel was a witness. He mm -hmm. taught them the scriptures. They knew the scriptures. He And here, when Jesus was born, these these wise men who had generations before learned under Daniel mm. uh, 
found the prophecy in the scriptures that talked about a star being born in, in, uh, in Judah, and they came to follow that star. They knew that that star was connected. It was a prophetic. Actually, that star was, uh, was the prophecy of Balaam, the prophet. Mm. And isn't it interesting how all these things are connected? Mm. And so they came and they asked the, the, the leaders of the, of, in Jerusalem, he says, where is this Messiah to be born? And they knew the prophecies. And we're going to read that prophecy um, Malach, or Micah 5.2, and it says mm. this, But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you be little among the thousands of, Jeru Jer of Judah, Yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting. Mm. So here we see that, that Jesus was not only prophesied, but it was prophesied that he was from everlasting. Mm. Jesus didn't begin uh, when he was born in Bethlehem. Right. He, was, he was the son of of God that that uh, was seen there by Nebuchadnezzar in the fiery furnace, right? Yes. Remember too what what Jesus when Jesus was talking to the scribes and Pharisees, and then they were questioning him and doubting what he was saying. And he and they said to, uh, he said to them, Abraham saw my day and was glad. And they said, How could Abraham have seen your day? You're not even forty years old yet. <laughs> and Jesus said to them, before Abraham was, I, I am. am. They knew exactly what Jesus was saying. They knew that Jesus was claiming to be the great I am, the one mm. that revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush. Amen. Take your feet, your sandals off your feet for the ground on which you stand is holy ground. He was the one when God came down on Sinai, Jesus was the one that transcribed the law of God with his mm. own finger on the tables of stone. This Jesus was the one that was interacting with Israel all through these times. So this is an exciting study. Yes. Uh, number 10, it says, was Christ involved in creation? Does he go back that far? Mm. Colossians 1, 14 to 16. Let's look it up. Mm -hmm. Colossians 1, 14 to 16, it says, referring to Christ, it says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, mm -hmm. who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. So he's, the, the son is the very image of the father. Yeah. Now look what it says about him. For in him were all things created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. For him. Amen. Jesus is the creator when it says, and in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. That's Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Said, Let us make man in our image. There's more than one there. That's Jesus and his father in the work of creation, creating the, this world and then populating it with human beings. With the Holy Spirit. So the here we yes. see like the Trinity, right? Right there. The triune the God. The Spirit of God was work, moving upon the waters, waters. there in Genesis, the in first part of Genesis. One. Yeah, that's exciting. Let's see. Um, number 11. Who was the rock that was with the children of Israel as they journeyed out of Egypt and into the promised land? 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4. 1 Corinthians 10. And it says, moreover, brethren, I would not have you that you, sh that you should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea. Mm. And were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did eat the same spiritual meat, and did drink all the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Nice. Remember Moses? Moses, God, God told Moses to strike the rock. When he struck the rock, water came out. Remember what Jesus said? If any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. 
He who believes on me, out of his inner, innermost being will flow rivers of living water. So here Christ is represented as the rock that followed, that provided water of life to all of Israel. And when Jesus stood up on the great day of the feast and says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Those who were spiritually inclined, those who were led by the spirit, recognized that at this temple service that was pointing to Christ, he was claiming to be that who pro that provided water for Israel throughout uh, their wanderings in the wilderness. Amen. That's beautiful. It's the same today. Yes. If we are thirsty, we know where to find our filling, not with the vain things of earth that only last for a moment, but the permanent things. Lay not your charges. I just remember that scripture. On earth, we are rot and, you know, mot, rust and moth corrupted, but we should yes. lay our treasures in heaven where it's eternal, even our faith in God. Yeah, number, number 12 is, what did Christ do for us? 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Let's read that. It says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Amen. Jesus was the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Remember when uh, John the Baptist was baptizing out in the wilderness there on the Jordan River? And yeah. Jesus came to him and John the Baptist saw him and he was told he was to be the forerunner to prepare the way of the Lord. Mm -hmm. and that he would go before him and that he would be uh, one as one crying out in the wilderness and here he was out in the wilderness crying out saying repent and be converted you know repent and uh, make your paths straight right make paths straight for the coming of the lord when jesus came up he said behold the lamb of god that taketh away the sin of the world jesus is that lamb um Number 13, it says, is Christ fully God? Hmm. John 1, 1 to 3. Let's look that up. John 1, 1 to 3. I know many people ask that question, especially like when they're just coming into the church. Yes. Is that question they, they ask. So what does the word say? Yes. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Hmm. The same was in the beginning with God. Yes. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. We just discovered that Jesus was the creator. He yes. was the one that created all things. So who is this word that is speaking of here in John 1? That's nothing other than Jesus Christ himself. Amen. That in him was life, and that life was the light of men. So in Jesus' mm -hmm. life. And he says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, peace. And that life, when we come to Jesus and we enter into his peace and his rest, we receive his life that he has offered for us. Yes. Number 14, was Jesus also man? Yes, remember um, Hebrews 2.14. Let's look it up. Hebrews 2.14. Um, the, the Bible it, uh, that was just read that, that uh, the son of God was there in the fiery furnace um, and that Jesus was also his, his favorite term for himself was the son of man. Mm -hmm. So he was the son of God, God and yet he referred himself as the son of man. Mm -hmm. Let's look what the Bible says here. Um. Hebrews 2, 14 to, 6, to 18, let's see. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, that's us, we're the children, we're partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Jesus, when he came as a little babe in Bethlehem, took our own nature and our own flesh and blood and it says that through death, he might destroy him that had the power over death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And, and verily he took not 
on himself the nature of angels, he took on him of the seed of Abraham. So he was born like of the product, the uh, offspring of Abraham. That's right. you and me. That's right. the children of Israel. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. He's made like us in all things, it says, yet without sin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it says, uh, wherefore, it be it, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself suffered being tempted, he was able to succor those who are tempted. So he was, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He's just made just like us. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's good news that even though he's like us, the only one thing difference between Jesus and us is it says in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, Behold, as I, it is written in the volume of the book, I, I came, O Lord, to do thy will, O God. So, you know, when we were born into this world, we weren't born with our, to, we did not come into this world to do the will of God. We came and we are selfish beings and we want to do our own will. Mm -hmm. When Jesus came, his will was surrendered to his father. He came surrendered from the very moment of conception to do the will of God. That's the very same thing that happens to us when we're born again. We surrender ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. We surrender our will to do the will of God. And mm -hmm. as we surrender our will, then Jesus becomes our savior. And not only that, he becomes, we become partaker of his nature. He gives us his Holy Spirit. We become like him. Mm -hmm. We are all children of God by creation. Mm -hmm. Every human being is a child of God by creation. Mm -hmm. But only those who have accepted Jesus as their Savior are the children of God by redemption. Amen. Those who are partaking of God's nature and being sustained by the, the Spirit of God and, and made holy by His righteousness, these are the children of God. Those who, who walk in the Spirit shall not fulfill the desires of the flesh. They are new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, I create all things new, right? Yeah, I like that part. You said, you know, the children, we are all children of creation. But when we accept Christ, we become the children of redemption. I like yes, that. <laughs> yes, And And we, that's because we become like him. That's, we partake of his nature. We're, the divine we're his nature. children <laughs> by partaking. We are like him now. Now we look like our father who is in heaven. He puts his spirit in us. He puts his attitudes, he, put his, he puts his love and, and graciousness and, and that, that very, he, he is love and he puts that love in us. That's how we know we're born again. If we have mm -hmm. fellowship with each other, he says, by this love, you will know that they are my disciples, exactly. Jesus said, right? Mm -hmm. How many members are in the Godhead? Matthew 28, 19, it says, we are to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So we have, you have the all three there in, in creation, uh, the Spirit moving upon the waters and God saying, let us make man in our image. And then in the New Testament, it talks about uh, we are to go forth and baptizing and making disciples of all nations and yeah. baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes. Next one. Next. I think you skipped number 15. Did I? Yeah. Oh, does you know. Christ understand humanity? Yes. Uh, yes, we didn't see it. It says, we, mm -hmm. have, we have not a high priest which not, cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Mm -hmm. We did touch on that at the end of Hebrews 2. It says... For that he himself hath suffered being tempted, yeah. is he is able to succor those who are tempted. He knows what it's like to su suffer from temptation. He was in all points tempted like as we are, mm -hmm. yet without sin. So he is our great uh, representative in heaven, but he's also the one that we model. We are uh, to become partakers of his nature. It says we are to... The, the end time church, it says, who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of, of Jesus. Jesus. Mm. We partake of his nature, his faith. It's his faith that sustains us. It's his life and spirit that, that keeps us 
from falling, says now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his throne with great joy. Such mighty words of, in the word of God. Amen. I like I like the last question that talks about the Godhead because, um, you know, some persons are confused about the Trinity, what it, you know, what it really means. So I like that that little comment there. Yeah, read says, that. You know, while there are three persons, they are one in unity, character and purpose. Since the Godhead is united in its purpose toward man, the Godhead is totally on man's side. The Father, Son and Holy Spirit are all working for the salvation, redemption, and deliverance of the human race. And I remembered one time I was doing a presentation, I don't remember where, but do you know that candle that has like the three wicks mm -hmm. inside, yes, but it's right. one candle. Yes. So I, I remember lighting the three parts to like just demonstrate that, you know, that that's how God is. They're just one, um, you know, as it's it says God. here. Yes, one God. We don't we don't serve three gods. <laughs> no, no, right. it's they're, yeah. they're one. You know, that word, uh, I am, I am God, that God is one, is the same word that says, and man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one. Same word. If two people, when they're married, become one, yes. and they're united, they're, they're in unity, that's the way that the, the Godhead is. They're in perfect unity, and they're of one mind and one spirit and one, one purpose, Right. Yes. And, and yet there are three individuals united together, mm -hmm. uh, much better than humans unite. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So I guess I'll just uh, now I can move on to the other part, the oppressor of God's people. And the first question here, it says, what are the names that scripture gives to the one who opposes Christ? And we find that in Isaiah 14, verse 12 and Revelation 12. Um, nine. So I'm going to read Isaiah 14 first. And it says here, 14 verse 12, and some of us, you know, are familiar with it. It says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which this weakened the nations? And in Revelation 12 and verse nine, it says, and is it Revelation 12, nine? Yeah. It says here, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So we see here, Lucifer, dragon, serpent, devil, Satan, it, all referring to the same person. And those are not some good names. I hope no parent, no parent names, name their children those names. <laughs> Yeah, because it means, you know, the accuser of the brethren. Our verse eight, uh, number 18 says, under the symbolism of the king of Tar, God describes the creation of Lucifer. What kind of being was Lu Lucifer when he was created? And you can find this in Ezekiel 28 and verse 15, uh, 12 to 15. Now just read that through. It's interesting, you know, how we have to really guard you know, guard our footstep, because even though we read this in the Old Testament, we, there are life applications for us now. Yes. So it says here, what kind of being was Lucifer when he was created? Ezekiel 28 and verses 12 to 15 says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipe was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. And verse 15 says, thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. So God did not create a bad devil, did he? No. <laughs> yeah, he created a perfect angel called Lucifer. But by his choice, he became evil. And so it is with us. God gives every man a choice and I pray that we will always choose Christ 
And when our strength is failing, we will cling to that rock that is higher than ourselves. Yes. Amen. Shows All the right. mystery of iniquity is so powerful. It, it, the highest angel in heaven, he was perfect in all his ways, and yet uh, until he was, till iniquity was found in him. Yes. Yeah. I just had history that. of iniquity is powerful stuff, and it, and if we're not de totally dependent upon Christ, it will it will uh, uh, degrade all of mm -hmm. us. It's like cancer that just spreads, and it, it must be destroyed, or it will uh, consume everything. Yeah. You just sit and think, how did how did iniquity started with? Lucifer in a perfect environment, you go over in your mind, but we see that it was his choice. So it's mm -hmm. definitely a mystery, right? Yes. Mm. All right. It says here, what did Lucifer attempt to do in heaven? And we find that answer in Isaiah 14 and verse 13, which says, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sight of the north. Lucifer wanted to sit where God sat. He wanted to rule from where God ruled. He felt he could do a better job of ruling the universe than, than God could. And this was where rebellion started. Amen. Yeah, it says in that last verse, it says he was corrupted because of his beauty. When we start admiring ourselves more than we should, that's where it all began. And pretty soon he thought he deserved to be above God. Mm -hmm. That's a dangerous place oh, to Lord. be. It's just a contrast, right? And we're going to look at that, the contrast with, you know, Lucifer and the son of God, the humility that he came to the earth uh, yes, in, right? Yes, what an <laughs> amazing difference. Right, yes. All right, uh, number, 20, uh, number 20, he says, as a result of Lucifer's rebellion, what happened to him? And we find that answer in Revelation chapter 12 and verses 7 to 9. And it says, and there was war in heaven, Michael... And his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So... War is not only happening on the earth, Elder David. Here we see war taking place in heaven. So because of that war and, you know, pride filling the heart of Lucifer, he was cast out of heaven. And I pray that we will not follow that route with, you know, pride in our heart. Because when we sow these seeds, you know, it produces, you know, just as you plant a seed and it grows into a plant, when we sow these seeds of pride and um, self-absorption, just focusing on self, 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 it bears fruit that are not, that are not, you know, uh, meat for repentance. You know, these right. are not the fruit that Christ wants us to bear. He said he's a vine. Once we connect with him, we will be able to bear much fruit. Amen. You know, it's interesting. It says uh, of Satan in that scripture, it says that there was no place found for him in heaven. He mm. was not compatible with heaven anymore. Mm -hmm. He had become uh, disconnected from God and, and it, the only righteousness, the only goodness comes from God. And when we separate from his righteousness and his goodness, we begin to be twisted and, and our characters deformed. And so that there's, we don't desire to be in the presence of God. It's, it's just like a child mm -hmm. when they've done something wrong, do they want to be in mom and dad's presence? No, oh, they want to hide. That is why there was no place found for them in heaven. So mm. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. Mm. That place is what Jesus is doing while he's interceding in our behalf. He's changing who we are yeah. so that there will be a place for us that we will love heaven mm. it, with, our, with our selfish, prideful hearts in our old nature. We would not love heaven. We would we would be totally humiliated there we would hide it just like when jesus comes and says they said hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne hide us let the rocks and and the mountains fall upon us to hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne mm. there was no place for them in heaven 
If God took them to heaven, they would not love it. They would want to hide. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah. Uh, ver- uh, number 21 says, since Lucifer was cast out of heaven, whom does he seek to deceive? Revelation 12 verse 12 gives us the answer, which says, therefore rejoice ye heavens and he that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down on you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that it, he had but a short time. So he seeks to deceive us, the people who dwell on the earth. Uh, 22 says, how does Satan deceive people? And let's look at 2 Corinthians 11 and verses 13 to 15. How does Satan deceive people? Verse 13 to 15 says, For such are false prophets, false apostles, deceit, sorry, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So Satan does not appear to us as that evil person with that fork, (laughs) you know, telling you to choose one way or the other, but he appears as someone having great light and truth. So we need to really ask the Holy Spirit to keep us, you know, keep us in the way. Otherwise, we're easily deceived, you know, so there's a verse in Matthew said, if it were possible, he would deceive even the very elect. So we have to really cling close to Jesus, not depending on our own education or whatever gifts or talents or whatever it is that we have in us. It will fail. If we don't have the Holy Spirit, we will fail. And that's That's what it says, not by might or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. All right, moving on. Can Satan really work miracles? Let's take a look at Revelation 16 and see what it says in verses 13 and 14. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the old world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So yes, the devil can really work miracles. And it says, how effective, next question, are Satan's deceptions. And we find that in Matthew 24 and verse 24. It says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall shew great thing, signs, great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So the deceptions of Satan in the last days will be so convincing that many will be deceived. Our faith cannot rest on miracles, signs, or wonders. Yes, good point. Our faith can safely rest only on the word of God. And I know that there are many televangelists today, you know, performing miracles. And people are drawn to this kind of, you know, because you want to get healing, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to read the word of God and let Jesus be our guide. Amen. All right. 25 says, with whom does Satan wage war in the last day? Very popular scripture. Um, Revelation 12 verse 17 gives us the answer. And it says, and the dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep at the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So it's us that keeps the commandment of God. And we're not only talking about Seventh-day Adventists, right, Elder David? God has right. his people in all religion on the world. Amen? That's right. Yeah, just wanted to make that point. 26, with whom do God's people have to contend in the battles of life? And I love this imagery in Ephesians 6. I just love that chapter. It's just so beautiful. Ephesians 6 and verse 12 tells us, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Maybe some of us would win the fight if we have, if we're stronger people, but we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So 
you know, the battle is in our minds and how important it is for us to keep our minds pure because that's where spiritual warfare takes place. I think there was another scripture that came to, to mind to the pulling down of strongholds. Yes. Do you remember Sting that? down imaginations and every high thing that exalts, that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, Amen. leading every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Amen. Yes. Yeah, so it's one every, of my favorites. Yes. Because I, <laughs> I have that. to claim it all the time. Right? <laughs> <laughs> me too. Me too. As I read this, that's a verse that just came back to me that every thought we have to just surrender to Jesus. Every day that we get up, we have to, it's like a fresh you know, yes. it's not from like what you did yesterday. The manna for yesterday was yesterday. That's Every right. day we have to get like fresh manna to deal with the trials because the devil is wrought. Especially now in 2021, we see the pandemic happening. We see prophecy fulfilling. He knows his time is short and we have to draw closer to Christ. And it's not based on our education. You know, like, oh, I know certain things. So I think I can deal with this. I have the science background. I have a religious degree or I have the well medical missionary. So we kind of feel confident in that, but it's only by the grace of God oh, through his Holy right. Spirit that we will be able. I mean, those things, I'm not saying those things don't have their place. It's good to have, yes, you know, education right. and so on, but let's be co-laborers with Christ. Let's not just depend on ourselves, you know, but let's partner with Christ because that's how we will be able to overcome not for one minute during the day can we separate ourselves from Christ because at that time we definitely will fail. Amen. If a perfect angel that lived in the presence of God be, could be corrupted, who was not living in a sinful world, but in the very presence of God, how much more are we who are sinful? Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. children. Jesus understood that we are sinful, evil people. Our hearts are. We must be born again. Otherwise, we are hopelessly and helplessly lost. We Amen. are so dependent upon Jesus and being filled with his spirit. Praise God. Amen. All right. Next question says, how can the Christian resist the adversary? This is a really good question. How can we resist? It says uh, Ephesians 6 and verse 11 to 13 says, put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I just read that part, right? Um, but I'll read it again. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the O armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. So how can the Christian resist the adversary? We have to put on the old armor of God. And if you continue yes. reading that passage, it tells you, you know, the breastplate of righteousness, having the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, having the shield of faith or feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You know, all of these things is what we we use to fight in this warfare. So yes. I pray that God will just bring his Holy Spirit, put our minds, you know, in the right place, connected to heaven. And then we have no need to fear. He says he has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. So it says here, what is this armor? Ephesians 6, 14 to uh, 17. Would you mind reading that for us, Elder David? 14 what to is 17? This? Yeah, Ephesians says, 6, 14 to 17. What is says, this armor? Yeah. Yeah, it says, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having your shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god amen praise the god praise god so we see here where these are the armor that we fight with truth thy word is truth righteousness which we can only receive from christ the gospel of peace which we only receive from reading the word of God. Faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God, right? Yes. Salvation, which we accept through faith, is the a, is a, is a grace of God, is nothing that we can do to earn it. And it finally talks about the word of God. It is what you use to fight and cut away on belief and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of yes. God, that we use that spirit to cut it up all the way. So these are what, you know, it's our only defense. You know, this deep 
personal relationship with God where you wake up, you spend time at his feet, you go throughout the day, you meditate upon him, you know, and as you talk about, you know, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Elder David, you mentioned earlier about, you know, having that transformation, you know, when you read through um, the uh, Matthew account of Nicodemus, how he experienced that you know, for if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Be all, all things are become yes. new. It's something that even after we get converted, sometimes in our journey, sometimes we get so absorbed with the cares of life that we sometimes forget who we are and the power yes. that that is available to us. So it is for us to just spend, you know, just a minute sometimes. Sometimes we can't even pray like Peter, Lord, save me. You know, just three words in the Lord. I remember you said when we did, prayer power principles i'll never forget you said that prayer that you pray for christ to really help you christ will never never close his ears to it right that's right never does that prayer go unanswered it says in desire of ages praise god yes all right and the last question we are elder david do you wish to align yourself with jesus christ and triumph with god's people when christ ends the great controversy my answer to that question is yes and we hope yours is too Yes. Yes. Um, when Jesus was in the wilderness, um, remember when this, he was tempted by the devil and mm-hmm. his answer was always, it is written. He referred to the word of God. He claimed the promises of God and it was by the word of God that he resisted the, the devil. And that is the only way. In fact, uh, the very next verse here where it talks about put on the whole armor of God and it mentions all the parts of the armor. And then in verse 18, it says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. So we put on this armor of God so that we can pray in the spirit and we're protected. It says, uh, praying always, always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So before we start interceding for people, we need to have this armor on. And this armor will protect us because there's one thing that the enemy hates, and that's when we begin to pray for one another. Mm. We are in a time where where it says, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together, Mm -hmm. especially as you see the day approaching. We need to be praying with each other, for each other, and helping each other, bearing one another's burdens, And thus fulfill the law of Christ. Mm -hmm. Uh, If we want to be like Jesus, we're not living to please ourselves. We're living living to uplift and and bring others to salvation. The Lord has anointed us to bring uh, liberty to the captives, to let the oppressed go free and Mm -hmm. break every yoke. The same thing that Jesus was called to do, he's called us to do. And he says, freely you have received, freely give. We are to receive from Jesus every morning. And as we do, we are to take our focus off of ourselves for the Mm -hmm. mindset on the flesh is death. But the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Mm -hmm. Get our minds on what Jesus has done for us and go and offer that to everybody that you come in contact with. This is a good lesson. Let's, Mm -hmm. is it time for our closing prayer? Yes. Okay. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you and praise you for giving us Jesus, who Nebuchadnezzar saw and recognized as the son of God in the midst of the fiery furnace, protecting his children who had been thrown there. Father, I just ask that when we go through our fiery test times, that we would acknowledge and that we would recognize that the very presence of Jesus is there. And Lord, I just ask too that uh, just like uh, Jesus prayed is when he said, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Lord, I just ask that you would prepare us for that place that we have in heaven, mm-hmm. that place where Satan was cast out of because there was no place for him in heaven. Mm-hmm. But I just ask that that by your Holy Spirit, you would transform us and make us into your image, make us after your likeness, that we would, by beholding, we would become changed, that we would, we would love you so much. You said, if, if you love me, keep my commandments. And Father, we, 
we need your spirit and you grace. You said, if you walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the desires of your flesh. Lord, I'm asking that you would fill us with your spirit, that we would become partakers of your nature that you would be glorified with our lives. And Father, I just ask that as we become like Jesus, as we commit ourselves uh, to serve you, that we would take the yoke of Christ and learn of him who is meek and lowly, and that we would find rest for our souls. I'm asking that your hand would be upon all those who are listening today. I'm asking that you would bless them, that the sense of your presence would be with them that your hand would be upon them, that you would bless them with the heritage of Jacob and that they would, that they would walk in the law of the Lord for the mm. law of the Lord is the, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Father, we just ask that you would do these things for your namesake. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. This was just a wonderful study and we just want to invite you to join us next week when we do episode three entitled the controversy begins all right any final words elder david um, oh, i kind of already mentioned my final words i was just <laughs> talking about you know uh the importance of of having the character of god put into us mm -hmm. so that there's a place for us in heaven so that we will love heaven so that we will be uh in in one accord, we will be one. Jesus, when he went in John 17, he said, uh, he prayed that as he was one with the Father, so that we would be one, be one. with him as yeah. he was one with the Father. So that's how he's preparing a place for us in heaven. He is making us one with himself so that as we are one with him, then there will be a place for us and Amen. he will come and take us home and, and claim us as his own. We will be like him for we, we will see him as he is. Praise the Lord. Amen. And my final word would be just try to reflect on the last scenes of Jesus's life as he was here on earth. Mm. And that would just draw your, your thoughts into the great sacrifice and what it means to just die to self. So wish you all a wonderful and safe week and God bless you all.